It is our honor on the Crucial Conversation to have uh, Pastor John Carroll here in Lisbon, Ohio, pastor at Point of Mercy, uh, to, to speak with us today. I have I first uh, found out about Brother Carroll's ministry. Actually, it was through a um, an apostolic vault uh, archive of a sermon you preached, I believe a uh, WPF um, event that uh, you had preached a message about um, the oneness of God. I, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember the, the exact... It was God in Christ and why it matters. Yes. That was the first time I'd, I'd heard you, you preach, and then I saw um, Den, uh, Dennis Gates that comes to our church and does m music for us, uh, knew of your, your YouTube series, and he told us that we needed to check it out uh, a long time ago before we even, the Crucial Conversation was even a thought, and so uh, your, your videos on Forward Talk that we were linking to, and uh, it, it's our honor to be your guest as well. Hey, your absolutely. Home. And while you're our guest, we're also... Uh, we're also your guests here because we're on Forward Talk. And so uh, thank you, Pastor Carroll, for taking the time yes. to meet with us. And thank you guys and for flying all the way up here from Arkansas to yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the trip awesome. over from Pittsburgh, I thought that we were going in the wrong direction <laughs> because we went up, down, around. Of course, we let, we're like, oh, it's only 60 miles, but why does it say an hour and a half? Yeah. But we found you out real out. quick. Yeah. When we found the one-lane bridge, <laughs> yeah, we, we, knew. we knew. Yeah, we knew. And there, there is no direct route to get to Pittsburgh or get here from Pittsburgh. It's, yeah. uh, it's no easy way to get back and forth. Well, it's definitely but, a journey I'm Dennis, looking forward Dennis, to. The guy that I did forward talk with originally, Phil Indris, uh, Dennis Gates is his uh, brother-in-law. Brother yes. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, man, I am glad you guys are here as well. So let's let's get right into the conversation here. We've got a lot to discuss. Um, you and Brian have been discussing quite a bit. I've been kind of left out in the cold, but I, I'm excited to hear um, <coughs> what you've got going on this book right here is going to be a game changer. But before we get there, let's hear a little bit about your story, where you come from, who you are. Explain to us John C. Carroll. Well, I was born in a pastor's home in Faraday, Louisiana. What's your What's your middle name? Calvin. So John Calvin. I get nervous as a oneness, <laughs> as a oneness person. I get nervous around people named John Calvin. I'm thankful you're oneness. Otherwise, I'd be really nervous right now. It's, I'd be like, is there any stakes out in the back that I could be burned at? <laughs> It's funny because my handle on most a lot of my social media is Calvinism my way, and so uh, people frequently ask me if I'm Calvinist. Right. But yeah, my name is John Calvin. My grandfather's, in fact, my my grandfather's name was John Calvin. I was born on his birthday, uh, got his real name and his nickname, so that's where mm -hmm. the John Calvin came from. But I was born uh, I was born in a pastor's home in Faraday, Louisiana, and um, uh, my dad left the church there when I was probably about 10 years old and evangelized full-time for a good number of years. And when I was probably about 18, he took a church for a couple years in in um, Tennessee and uh, has been evangelizing again since then. So I've, I've been born and raised in a pastor-preacher's home my entire life. I started... Um, well, first of all, I got the Holy Ghost at the age of five years old and started preaching when I was, I think, 16. And so I've been preaching for over 25 years, mostly in full-time ministry. Wow, that's awesome. That is awesome. So when you when you received the Holy Ghost at the age of five and you uh, started preaching at 15, tell us about the time where you got called into the ministry and how did you handle that? I mean, because at 15 years old, you're still a child. Yeah. So relaying that to somebody and starting to get poured into, and I'll be honest with you, there's not a lot of things a 15-year-old has to say to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest, there probably wasn't a lot of things a lot of things that I really had to say to anybody sure. at 15 years old either. Um, but I was, uh, I was probably prophesied over a good half a dozen times well before that that, I had a call on my life to ministry, and uh, I always hated it every time I heard it. The last thing I wanted to do was be a preacher. Um, but the the reason why I hated it so bad every time somebody told me that I was called to preach is I knew down deep in my heart I was, and I didn't, I did not want to do it. Um, my my very first message was at 
I was in Alabama. My dad was preaching revival for uh, James Swindle <clears throat> in Alabama. And um, <clears throat> I preached my first message at a little youth service on a, a, a Sunday evening service of revival. They always had like a, um, they started Sunday night service with like a, a small youth service before they got into the main worship service. And um, my dad, uh, or the pastor, and asked me up to come to the pulpit. And uh, I went to the pulpit, and he got up from one side of the platform to walk to the other side of the platform to uh, put on the recording to record my first sermon. And by the time he got over, got the tape in, push record, I was done. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> there probably wasn't, there probably isn't That's much funny. of that first sermon recorded. But I've gone from there to being accused of being one of the longest winded preachers at Pentecost. So. <laughs> How about that? So. Whenever you preached your first sermon at the age of 15, correct, um, when did you realize that there was a shift uh, from just preaching to maybe evangelizing or pastoring? How did that How did that transpire? Well, from the very beginning, I've always had a very um, doctrinal emphasis to all of my preaching. I was obsessed with um, Godhead debates from even before I started preaching. So uh, every Marvin Hicks debate that was available— out there, I I listened to it. Every Robert Bayer debate, I listened to it. I could I listened to him so much I could give both I could say both <laughs> speeches with both speakers as they were giving them. <laughs> and so, I did a lot of early in my ministry. I did a, a ton of memorization, and so a lot of my a lot of my early preaching uh, and still is very was very doctrinally uh, centered. And so I preached a lot of Godhead sermons. And probably the one that I have preached the most, and it's uh, it's online. Uh, if you uh, Google it, is a message I preached called "I Am a Jehovah's Witness." And so, you want to elaborate on that just a little bit? Yeah, you are my witness, saith Jehovah, yeah. whom I have chosen, uh-huh. that you may know that I am He. So, so, how old were you when you preached that? Um, I I don't even remember. I've probably preached that message close to two hundred times. I got so. you. So, but but that first time, whenever somebody heard you and they're like, "Is this a seventeen year old kid changing doctrine on us right here?" We gotta be careful with this yeah. guy. So obviously, the point Pick is some interest. the The point of the message is is that I am the real Jehovah Witness. Sure. That yeah. Yeah. that Amen. Jehovah revealed Himself incarnationally right. in the man Christ Jesus. Sure, and so we are the real Jehovah's Witnesses. If anybody that's listening or watching this has not um, been connected to some of the debates that Brother Carroll has online, I would like to <coughs> recommend. That people check those out. Uh, he's got some debates. On, is it like BibleDebates.info? Yeah, uh, I have he's a got, couple debates on there, but they're pretty old. Yeah, but I, I greatly enjoyed. He, you've got a, the debate over uh, the impeccability of Christ. Yeah, I really enjoyed that one. And then um, over um, the first day of the week, uh, Sabbath, uh, Lord uh, Supper. Lord's Supper. Yes, that was a very interesting, very very awesome. I enjoyed those. Uh, got a lot of material that uh, are, is you can use beyond just those debate topics because obviously it's all kind of interwoven like the things with the impeccability of Christ you can use that when you teach the oneness of God yeah. um, so many different things um, but and as far as I know the impec- the impeccability of Christ debate that I have with Pat Donahue is the only impeccability of Christ debate available I don't think anybody really? else has ever formally debated that topic. So I want to ask you a question. Yeah, it's in written and audio form. I want to ask you a question that I know a lot of our listeners or even your listeners may be thinking, what is the purpose of debating somebody? What's the purpose of a Christian debate? To win. <laughs> I, so I understand, to I understand that. To demolish and destroy, yeah. humiliate your opponent. But don't you to debate your cause with I'm going to play devil's advocate <laughs> here because we have talked to an apostolic debater already, but here's devil's advocate. Yeah, Jason Weatherly. Yeah, yeah, Jason Jason yeah, I've yeah. only moderated his last four or five debates. So, so my question is, uh, as devil's advocate, why, why would somebody want to argue God's Word instead of just study it together? Well, uh, if, if you're doing it with the right heart and right attitude, you know that <clears throat> you're going into a debate with an evangelistic focus. Mm. It, it was the same concept of Paul as his manner was. He would enter into the synagogues and temples and dispute with the Pharisees and the, the Jews of his day. And so what other opportunity am I going to have as an apostolic preacher to have 150 or 200 Church of Christ people 
sit and listen to me preach a message. Right. First of all, I couldn't do that, but because I would, <laughs> I feel like I'd, I'd say the word "shut up" a lot. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, and get frustrated. And but what's the importance of keeping the right spirit of that? Well, obviously, uh, we are to speak the truth in love, and so it, it doesn't matter how much truth we are speaking if we are speaking it hatefully then the people that we are attempting to convert or win are, are not going to hear what we're yeah. saying. They're going to hear how we're saying it. Sure. And I don't think in the first couple of debates that I had that I uh, probably accomplished that all very well, but <laughs> elaborate on that. <laughs> it was, I was, I just, I was 20, 22, 23 years old. I debated Tommy Thrasher, my first debate. He had at that time had almost two hundred debates, so he was like yeah, professional. he was like the big dog of at the time, and uh, so my very first debate, I I debated the biggest Church of Christ name that there was, um, and so I was I was going for him, mm-hmm. and I went I went at him hard. Did you walk out with the belt? I did. Did you? Yeah, I think I did. I think so. That's awesome. So, Brian, I want you to explain to our listeners and to John C. Carroll here why um, you're not really a debate, but your guys' study with the Church of Christ um, ended with you getting upset and why <laughs> when you tell me I was furious. No, I mean, it was, it was one of those things that um, – Whenever you back somebody into a corner and they only have one place to go, and that's whenever it's, well, here's the thing. If if what you're saying is true, if you, our, our discussions that I had were, was always about whether or not miracles were still for today yeah. and whether or not uh, the infilling of the Holy Ghost was still by the initial sign of speaking in tongues. And so the where the debate ultimately came to is, well, perform a miracle right now. Yeah. If you cannot produce a miracle right now, then obviously what you're saying is not true because there's you could you should be able to because of course with um, with the Church of Christ they're all about how it authorizing and confirming the word yeah and so if what you're saying is authorized it will be confirmed by a miracle following and and it's it's one of those things that um, I think Jason Weatherly actually puts it the best whenever he puts his slide up and has their picture yeah. drawn in in the chicken coop. Birds of a feather yeah, flock together. And the birds of a, and they've got. The, he's got <laughs> Have the, you ever seen that chart? I haven't seen that particular chart. He's telling me about it where he's got the picture of the devil of a Pharisee and then he draws his debate opponent and says, "Birds of a feather, they always flock together." Yeah. Because as the devil uh, accused Jesus and said to him, "If thou be the Son of God, then uh, you perform all these different works. You know, the turn these stones into bread." I mean, ultimately, it always comes down to, well, let's see it happen. Let's prove it. And so where our guy went to in the most recent one I did was after we had we had debated for two hours, and uh, and he, he was like, well, here's the thing. I need a liver transplant. I'm living on borrowed time. I'm supposed, my doctor told me nine years ago I'd be dead in 10 years. Um, if you pray for me, I'll stop taking my medicine today. And when I go to the hospital in three days, I just want you guys to know it'll be on you because I'll be on life support. And it's just like one of those things that it's like, well, I mean, you're you're asking us to do something that we can't force God's hand to do anything because in God's sovereignty, God ch- chooses to perform miracles in some situations. In some situations, He doesn't. And in that moment, I didn't have a chance to talk about like even the man that was at the at the temple yeah. um, when Jesus walked this earth. This man had been at the the temple gate by the time we get to Acts, where he had sat there for twelve years or so. So Jesus had walked by this guy, and Jesus didn't even heal him until. And the, Paul, uh, Paul left Trotham sick at Miletum, so mm-hmm. uh, Paul didn't. the The idea that they have is that the apostles just like went around clearing out graveyards, clearing out whatever hospitals right. they had in that day. That they just went around just like touching everybody, healing everybody. Nobody was sick. Mm-hmm. Well, that's simply not the case. Right. And the majority of the times that that the apostles performed miracles, it was for the purpose of converting converting people who had open, willing hearts to hear the gospel. Absolutely. And so, uh, people like that <coughs> are trying to trying to force force God's hand. Exactly. And They're trying to say, "I won't believe unless you do." Yeah. And that was the thing with me is just like, well, I mean, that, 
that's just this is uh, how God operates. Is that you're you're supposed to believe because, like Hebrew says, it says they that believeth uh, that that He is He is rewarded to them that oh, I can't even quote the verse right now. I'm, he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and, and that, that He is, is a rewarder, rewarder of them, of them that, that diligently, diligently seek, seek him. him. And uh, and then even with Jesus, whenever He went into His home city, He could perform no mighty work because of their unbelief. Yes, that's and, right. And the guy was saying, well, if you look at the the people that the apostles walked by and their shadow just fell over them. He's like, they didn't have faith. Well, you don't know they didn't have faith. That's right. I mean, you're judging people that were alive 2,000 years ago. You don't know what measure of faith that they had in that moment. They were sitting there for what purpose? Mm -hmm. They were expecting something. Even if their initial anticipation was of a monetary gift, they were sitting there in faith believing somebody would do something in them, give something to them. Yeah. So there was a small degree of faith Somewhere in that. And so I, I, don't, I don't believe God works through our negative faith. No, He doesn't. And God is not going to be held hostage to, to anybody. Absolutely. And so, yeah, I mean, there are numerous cases in the Bible where people, godly people, died. The apostles prayed for people and they didn't get healed. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that the, the apostles just went around just curing everything inside so, is a misconception. It's like the so miracles people. still happen. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So how, how does how does one explain to the people of that faith, um, how, how did you explain it, Brian? They believe in uh, healings, correct? Well, they would so, say if it was something they couldn't explain, they would say that it was, it was just God's um, uh, provision. Yeah. We, we, it was his unexplainable provision that God provided something, but it was not a miracle. Huh. That's how they were. Because there was a guy that was in the room. Well, thank God for God's provisions. Yeah. yeah. Thank God for God's unexplainable, <laughs> yeah. unexplainable provisions. Yeah, exactly. Sounds kind of like the definition of a miracle to me. <laughs> yeah. Especially whenever I had them on, at the very beginning of it, I wrote down their exact definition of what a miracle was, and it was the setting aside of natural law. And when somebody has a skin disease that goes to bed with a skin disease, that was prayed for that night, and the next morning they woke up totally with with it healed. Uh, that to me, that didn't just happen. There was a young man that I went to church with. I was in the service when it happened. Young man that I grew up with in Louisiana had had both of his kidneys surgically removed hmm. by doctors. Was on dialysis like six days a week. Um, did not have any kidneys in his body whatsoever. And um, in Winsboro, Louisiana, one night Eddie Jones called a a prayer line, a healing line. This young man came up. He prayed for him and uh, went home that night. In the middle of the night, he woke up with his bed soaking wet where he had urinated all over himself. Hmm. And uh, What an to, awesome feeling that must actually be. I, I mean. know. What an awesome yeah. feeling as an adult <laughs> yeah. young man to wake up having wet the bed. Yeah. Yeah. That puts but they, everything in perspective. But they went to the, he went to the doctor. His, his grand, he lived with his grandmother. They made a doctor's appointment. They went in and did x-rays, and he had two brand-new kidneys in his body. Unexplainable. Exactly. There's there's no natural explanation. Well, let me and, tell you. And if you're dependent on CNN to broadcast stuff like that, forget about it. Oh, yeah. And that, that, Fox that, News, that, forget that, about it. Yeah, that's right. That was another – yeah, I mean, it didn't matter what the news at, sure. out, outlook, outlet is. Um, that was another thing they were saying is, why don't we hear about them all the time if there's miracles? Roy Nash, Roy Nash uh, his parents, he fell and broke his arm clean in two. I mean, it wasn't fractured. The bones were – completely broken into and instead of taking him to the doctor they brought him to my dad's church in Faraday, louisiana brought him into service my dad picked that picked that kid up prayed for him and when he set him down his his arm was completely wow. and perfectly healed. so wow. it's miracles are not just healings as well so my mother-in-law tells this story everywhere she goes she was a uh, her and her husband's a traveling children's evangelist, and I'm hoping to build somebody's faith real quick. But uh, there was um, this this service that they were at, and this uh, prophet calls Kim, my mother-in-law, up and says, uh, "God has found favor in you. You can ask God for whatever you want tonight, but make sure you do it before you go to bed." So she didn't know what to ask for. She didn't want to take that for granted. She went back to her seat and she said, oh, God, what do I ask for? There's so many things. Do I want to see this person saved or what, what, do, I, what do I want? And uh, she said she got a little bit of arrogance about it. So she went back up to him and said, can I ask for more than one thing? And that minister said, as long as you do it before you go to bed. <laughs> so she goes home and she pulls out a notebook and she starts listing things in order. And one thing that you need to know, and she's, she'd be okay with me saying this, but that 
her and her husband was not um, well off money wise and they worked for the Lord nonstop and sometimes that's not always financially rewarding Mm -hmm. but um, she wrote in there I need a brand new roof on my house and I can't afford it she closed that notebook up put it in a bookshelf in her closet uh, goes to bed and then they leave for a children's revival they come home and a brand new roof is put on their house (laughs) and little does the people know that did it for free that in her bedroom in the closet on a bookshelf in a notebook it says, God, I need a brand new roof on my house. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. encouraging. I mean, I so all you got to do is, you just said, you got to believe. You've got to believe. And I've had, when I was evangelizing, I preached I preached miracles. I went through a phase where I preached miracles a lot. And I used to have, every time one a miracle would happen in, in a service that I preached, I had people write, their, write the testimony of what happened down and give it to me. And I don't know what happened to them, but I had a, I had a bag full of, of testimonies of, of people that had um, miracles of healing, instantaneous healing. Sure. And there's this guy that comes to our church often in Jonesboro. He said, God d- does not need cheerleading. Mm-hmm. If you've prayed for a miracle yeah. and it's not happened, don't give up. And you don't have to say, oh, well, it's happened. I'll praise him for it anyway. Yeah. Keep praying for it. Keep yeah. believing in it. Right. Yeah. And Blyville, Arkansas. Um, That's where my mother-in-law's from. Blyville, Arkansas. Yeah. Um, Harold Anderson's son. What was his? I can't remember his name right now. Harold would be... Um, Greg, he goes to Greg, yeah, Anderson. Greg Anderson. Yeah, Greg yeah. Anderson. That's right. He pastored. We was good friends back then, but that was like 25 years ago. Mm-hmm. Greg Anderson was pastoring in Blyville, Arkansas and had a young girl in his church that uh, they had taken bones from other part of her body and fused her, her, her spine together. And I think they had, they had done like 20... I think if I, my memory serves me correct, 21 surgeries wow. on her back. And they were going into the doctor to to uh, have a checkup for for uh, the next procedure that they were going to do. And her mother brought her up for prayer. And uh, Greg Anderson and I prayed for this young girl. And uh, when they went to the hospital the next day, the doctor did an x-ray of her back and said they could not even tell where any fusions mm. had taken place. That she had never have to. Have How do you surgery. explain something like that? Yeah, you can. Yeah. And the untold stories of people saying, "God, if what you're speaking to me is the truth, will you confirm it by somebody else?" <laughs> and then by the time the service is over, a person they hardly even speak to in the church comes by and says, "Hey, I just want to let you know, I feel like God told me this." I mean, when when it happens once, I guess you could say it was coincidence. Yeah. But I know in my life personally, it's happened more than once. I mean, I just refuse to believe that things like that just happened no they yeah. don't coincidence <laughs> all right so we kind of got took that long road there yeah hey, um, let me ask you one real quick one uh you talked about how uh your dad prayed for this uh for this young man yeah um i saw on instagram how your dad had you had like put down on the total of how many hours your dad has prayed he over prays the- for a min- he prays a minimum of eight hours a day and he has four wow i don't even know how many years I know when we first started uh, praying together as a family, we were, um, uh, it has to be uh, 30 years ago or more, 35 years ago, we first started praying together as a family every day. It started out with an hour a day. Then we went to praying together as a family two hours a day. Mm-hmm. And um, I bet as a child you loved that. I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> we used to joke that there is no way you can backslide in our house. All we ever do is pray, pray, pray. Did y'all, did y'all pray over your food? Uh, man, we prayed over <laughs> everything two or three times. What kind of impact has your has your dad and his prayer well, life had well, on you? Well, obviously, I mean, um, an incredible impact. He's he's by far the most disciplined disciplined man that I know most disciplined man I've ever even heard of. Mm-hmm. Um, he and my mother fasted together one time for 60 days as a couple. Mm. My dad fasted one time alone himself for 84 days. Wow. And um, <clears throat> like I say, he prays eight hours every day of his life. Mm-hmm. Um, but accompanying that is just has been an incredible, incredible ministry of 50-plus years. And uh, he... Um, He's prayed through multiplied thousands of people in revivals over the years. Um, probably, probably the for me the most striking thing about my dad's ministry, and it's the thing that n- nobody knows about, 
hardly anybody knows about. They know about the hundred soul revivals that he's had and, mm-hmm. and all the people that he's prayed through. But um, I wrote a blog about him a few years ago called A Man of Vision. And um, God always has always spoken to my dad in dreams. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> he would give him, oftentimes he would give him a, a dream or a vision of what was about to happen in the next revival. And uh, when I was a young teenager traveling with my father between revivals, before he got a travel trailer, we used to always carry a tent with us, and we'd stay in state parks in tents between uh, hmm. traveling, you know, overnight. If we were going to have to stay somewhere, we'd, we'd stay in a tent in a state park somewhere. And uh, one night in one of those overnight uh, ventures at a state park, my dad woke up, had a dream and woke up the next morning and uh, told us, and um, the dream he had was he and mom were um, on a on a the bank of a lake or a pond, and dad said he was catching fish, and um, dad said he was catching fish, and he was just catching one right after another, and he was just throwing them up up on the bank, and uh, at some point in the dream, my mom asked him, "How many do you think there are?" And he said, um, "There's at least fifty, and." Um, he told us, he said, God spoke to me through this dream that we're going to have, we're about to have a revival where at least 50 people receive, receive the Holy Ghost. And um, it was a couple churches later in Bakersfield, California. Hmm. We were there for, I think, 13 weeks, and we had 50 people receive the baptism of the Holy Jeez. Ghost. Wow. And we could re- I could repeat stories like that over and over again. If you don't mind, I'd like to tell, like... Yeah. Tell you two more. Yeah, go ahead. Two more quick ones. Awesome. <laughs> All right, so we're we're in Ohio, and uh, Dad tells us, <clears throat> Dad gets up and tells us that he had a dream. Him, him, and a group of church people are uh, walking, I guess, through a field, and they come up on a, a shallow grave, and with his hand, he starts pushing back the dirt, and um, very quickly, he starts uncovering this lady, and he described her, describes how tall she is, what she looks like, what color her hair. This is, is in the dream. Yeah, okay. how longer how long her <laughs> hair is, everything. Okay. And so he says when he pulls her up out of the grave, she is just like her hands and her feet are tied with just cord after cord after cord. And so not only was she in, in the grave, but she was she was bound. And he said he took a, a small uh, pen knife out of his pocket and was very slowly and surgically cutting those cords off of her hand to keep from hurting her, cutting her. And um, after a while, he got all the cords off of her, and she was she was free. And um, <clears throat> the next, I believe it was the next day, within the next day or two, uh, a pastor, a friend of Dad's from Louisiana, called and asked him to come preach a revival. And um, the first night of that revival, that lady that he described mm. to a T walked through the back door. Wow. Jeez. Same height, hair color. And he'd already told you and everything. Oh, he'd already, no, it, he didn't, he didn't tell us afterwards. Like it he was told well us, before. yeah, mm-hmm. days before we got there. And How for, old were you when this stuff happened? Dude, I was a teenager. I called dibs mid, on the next question after that. Mid, <laughs> mid, mid to late teens. Okay, so first night of revival, this lady walks in. And of course, we're freaked out because we know my dad. I oh just told us word. in this dream, hey, for 21 straight nights without any rest night, for like three hours a night, my dad prayed for this lady to receive the Holy Ghost. And on the 21st night, she re- she received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the only lady in the revival, the only person in the revival to get the Holy Ghost. Jeez. But God, God spoke to dad in Ohio, sent him to Louisiana to preach revival, and gave him a dream before he got there to give him Praise the faith God. to pray 21 nights for one person to receive the baptism Jeez. of the Holy Ghost. And the final story is in... <clears throat> in this the ain't same- the final one. We're going to keep on going. <laughs> this is, no, it might be the final one. We might need to move forward. The, yeah, the, so we, did, we might need to do some forward talk after yeah. this story. <laughs> so we were in the same church where I preached my first sermon. Dad was in revival there. And um, <clears throat> he was up. He's known for travailing prayer and he got in the pulpit and hadn't started preaching yet <clears throat> he was he was sort of laid over the pulpit and he was he was just praying and all of a sudden he just started saying over and over in the microphone repeating over and over yes you can i said you can yes you can i said you can 
Well, a few minutes later, uh, one of the ladies in the church, her husband had had uh, never had the Holy Ghost, never been in the church, came down to the altar, and he got the Holy Ghost that night. But what we didn't know until after the service was he had leaned over and said to his wife, I would love to go down and pray, but I just can't live it. And the <laughs> very moment, the words, <laughs> I can't live it, came out of his mouth, in the pulpit, my dad started screaming, "Yes, you can." My word. So uh, hurry up, because I got something to say. <laughs> so my my question, you go first because mine actually is going to kind of right, take so us off topic. A, a story I have a lot like that is, we were in a revival. Probably revivals aren't the same anymore like they're they not, used to be. Um, we didn't have Mondays off for rest. No. Um, even though I'm a younger person. Um, I still remember those revivals where it was, uh, we had one for an entire month and it was church every single day. Yeah. And um, fasting through the week and then break the fast on the weekends, but we're having church no matter what. Yeah. yeah. You don't receive the Holy Spirit in those meetings. It's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Well, anyway, we had this, our evangelist at the time, um, someone got up to prophesy and, uh, or it was a tongues and interpretation. Somebody gave up, got up to interpret. And um, after he was done speaking the tongues, another man began to give the interpretation. And um, there was a Hispanic guy that was there. It was his first time ever there. And um, our evangelist was sitting there uh, with his hands or his head in his hands. And as the interpretation was going, he started speaking in tongues. The evangelist did again. And little did we know it wasn't another tongues. He was speaking perfectly. Ooh word for word Spanish to the guy in the back <laughs> and to awesome. see that guy in the back just break yeah oh my word man that's that that's 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 stuff you can't you no. once again you can't explain no mm-hmm. all right Brian what do you so, got <laughs> go ahead no go ahead so my question was going to be is that through everything that you've experienced with with your dad's ministry and 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 seeing all these people receive the Holy Ghost different miracles that you've seen has there been a time where you've doubted whether or not this was the truth or doubted whether or not like that God was even real uh, yeah because I, I couldn't imagine not after all the things you've seen oh I absolutely did though like it's uh, the my struggle with with uh, with faith and all the way down to the very fundamental level of of believing in the existence of God has has been uh, real for me for most of my adult life. In fact, it's probably only been in the last four or five years that I haven't struggled deeply with whether or not God exists, whether Scripture is true. And uh, I, I would usually have probably about three or four major bouts a year with it where I would be depressed for probably three or four or five weeks mm. at a time. Almost to the point to where it would be in, almost impossible to get out of bed and function. And I wonder so, how many. <laughs> I'm sorry to cut you off, but I just wonder how many. I'm going to put it in the category of ministers are really that way. Well, I preached about this at a conference at the That's God in Christ and why it, mm-hmm. why it matters. I talked about it in that message. Yeah, and um, I had multiple pastors come up to me as a result of that and thanked me for being honest about it because they have the exact same exact same struggles. So why why does apostolics feel the need to um say everything is okay? Why do why do we feel the need to lie? Because we're because we do very much have an epidemic of Phariseeism where how things appear are way more important than how things are. He's preaching. Hmm. Wow, I mean, that's why we can. That's mm, why we. That's why we have you're hitting, pastors. That's you're why, hitting me real deep. Right <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why we have pastors that are drowning in debt, but wear Gucci and right. and Rolexes mm. because we're concerned about how things are rather than or how things appear rather than how they are. And so we do that not only with clothing, but we do that with character. So there was my very first real big boy job. Yeah, my boss always told me. If you stay busy, perception becomes reality. Yeah. And I wonder mm-hmm. if I'm not gonna say pastors because that's very direct, but I wonder how many Christians, apostolics, think that 
if I act all right, I'll be all right. When all of a sudden they start dealing with suicidal thoughts and yeah. they start dealing with depression, they start dealing with self worth. Yeah, I wonder if they're hoping if I act one way, I'll become one way. Yeah, it, it is because we we have very much a law based approach to mm-hmm. to first of all initial salvation and then secondly ongoing salvation. Yeah, we have a very distorted view of the gospel. And I the, really don't think that most most ultra conservative apostolics have a revelation of the gospel. Wow. And you know, I think that um, I think that. <laughs> woo, can we get a little deep here? Sure. <laughs> I think that um, apostolics will find acceptance from other apostolics in any form and facet in life, whether it be uh, status or um, relationship or whether which it is be, yeah, which is which is which drives the majority of the standards that we preach. Yeah, and and, and they don't care who they step on or who they That's hurt right. as long as they're perceived a certain way. Which is which is why pastors preach the majority of the standards they preach. They preach stand, or they don't. Or don't. They preach the standards that they preach in their church to please preacher friends that are a thousand miles away. And elders in the church. And so <laughs> and so they they abuse and oppress local congregations trying to impress guys that pastor a thousand fifteen hundred miles away mm-hmm. see I've always accepted um the the definitions as it's given down of what liberal Pentecostal is <laughs> and conservative Pentecost is until a few weeks ago at eleven thirty I get a phone call and I answer and it's John Carroll saying, Man of God, what are you doing? And I'm like, It's eleven thirty, brother. And so I get up and I go in the kitchen and we're talking. Don't be calling me at eleven thirty. I don't. I won't. We're talking It'll about different. Thirty. We're, yeah, we're talking about different things with, with the conversation and something got brought up. I can't even remember now what it was. And you actually blew my mind by redefining the whole terms of what a true conservative apostolic is and a true liberal Pentecostal is when you look at it in terms of government. Can you explain? Yeah, that's uh, uh, I have a section, in a chapter in this book right here where I deal with that. What is that book? Uh, Are You a Christian Redefining Apostolic? By who? John C. Carroll. <laughs> John Calvin Carroll. <laughs> I was about to ask what the same was. Same plug right there. Exactly right. His way in that All book. right, bring it up. <laughs> and so uh, a quote that I want to reference from the book, Daniel McDonald. I quote Daniel McDonald in the book making the statement that Many of our standards are not designed to separate us from the world. They're designed to separate us from other apostolics. Mm. Woo! <laughs> I was listening to, to your sermons today from the series that's on this. It's on your church's podcast. And and there was there was one thing that you said. I don't know if it was something. It was when he, a quote original with you. But the, uh, the quote was, you don't have to be my twin to be my brother. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, Pastor Ron Townsley in... in mm. uh, Princeton, Illinois, the person that I quoted as saying that. But the idea of conservative versus liberal, we get it all. I think we get it completely wrong. So the traditional way in which we we call someone conservative in Pentecost is the guy with the most things that he preaches against. Yeah, the highest regulations. The highest level of regulations is the conservative guy. Mm-hmm. And the guy with the most amount of of uh are the least amount of regulations is the liberal guy and so what i did was i i just simply took the term conservative to conserve to be conservative means you conserve something you're conserving an idea or a tradition of some sort and so the question that i ask is what are we trying to conserve and as the holy nation our thing that we are trying to conserve is the original intent of our constitution which is which are the scriptures and so, to be conservative is to conserve the original, uh, the the original intent of of our documents, our founding documents, which is the Bible. And um, and so, what how most of us understand conservative is is we're trying to conserve 1950 rather than 8050. Mm. And so, what we're trying to conserve is a tradition from uh, from the from the 20th century rather than the first century. And so, in and, and then I also did the parallel to American politics. In American politics, conservatives are the ones that say we are limited in what we can restrict by the Constitution. That we are against centralized government, centralized power. We are against 
big government, big regulations. We're against government telling us you can't do this, you can't do this. You, you can't carry this kind of weapon. You can't use this kind of speech. And we're for personal freedom. <clears throat> personal freedom, whereas liberals and progressives are about government controlling health care, uh, government regulation over, uh, over business, etc. And so liberals are those who take liberties with the Constitution. They view the Constitution as a living and evol- an evolving document. Whereas conservatives like Antonin Scalia says, no, the Constitution is, is a dead document, that it's not living and evolving. It says what it says. It's not available it, for liberty. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so to take those liberations, you yeah. can't. So liberals are the ones who take liberties with the Constitution mm-hmm. that the original founding fathers did not intend. And so they impose regulations that were not intended by the founding fathers. And so conservatives are those that say, no, our view of any given issue in our country is limited to the original intent of of those who wrote the constitution and so to be conservative to be conservative is not about being the most restrictive it's about having it's about having the most liberties and so when i make an argument a biblical argument from scripture that that it's okay for a man to have a beard that's not liberal that's conservative and when someone says that a man cannot have a beard and be saved or cannot have a beard and be in fellowship with our church or our congregation, that's liberal because he's taking liberties with the Constitution. You are raising some people's hair on the back of their neck right now. <laughs> <laughs> because you're taking liberties with our Constitution that our Constitution does not give you. And and that is, in fact, the one standard that we that we have traditionally preached as apostolic since since the 50s and 60s, that not only is the Bible silent about, a lot of the standards that we preach the Bible is silent about. And so we use principles to apply to certain cultural issues. But the issue of facial hair, not only is the Bible not silent about it, the Bible tells us exactly the opposite of what we preach about that particular mm. issue. And so it is not being conservative to preach against facial hair. It is liberal to preach against facial hair. Wow. And, you know, one of the things about having a conservative government is the government has to trust its citizens to not devolve into anarchy and and things into chaos. Like one of the principles of having um, a a, a free society is you have to be able to trust one another. And, And I think... When and this is my personal opinion, when when people are in a real stringent, strict church, you rob people of the opportunity of hearing what God has to say to them about their own personal thing. If, if God speaks to an individual and says, "In your worship to me, I'm asking you to lay this aside," yeah, and yet when everything is so strict and stringent, there's no opportunity for them to have that kind of walk with God because they've already. I mean, there's only so much yeah, they the, have the, left to even the pastor. Yet. The pastor has replaced the Holy Ghost in most churches, most of our traditional apostolic churches. The voice of the pastor has replaced the voice of the, the Holy Ghost. That's a dangerous place. The only thing we need the Holy Ghost for in a, the mm. average Pentecostal church is to speak in tongues. It isn't to live right. Mm. Mm. Um, in, in your, in, is this in your book, uh, what I asked you about with the um, numerical val- value of the Greek words? Yeah, it's in Are You a Christian Too? Okay. I knew it was in the sermon series, but I didn't know if it yeah, made it into it, the book. Yeah, it was but, in the book. It's in the book um, as well. Now that we've kind of teased it to the audience, we'll explain uh, what are the yeah, only... because Brian explained this to me in the airport, and I was kind of dumbfounded almost. What are the only two words that the Greek numerical value in the New Testament Greek adds up to 666? Well, I'll actually just uh, I'll read that I'll read that excerpt from my book, uh, just to. It kind of shakes you up when you hear this, doesn't it, Tony? It does. I mean, I've thought about it quite a bit. <laughs> okay, so I wrote the Greek word for tradition is paradosis. While I do not place great weight on gematria, it is interesting that paradosis is one of only two nouns in two thousand in the Greek New Testament, which uh, numerically equals six six six, the mark of the beast in Revelation thirteen eighteen. The other Greek noun from the New Testament that equals six 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 in gematria is wealth. Nothing can more adequately express man's rebellion against God than our abuse of money and religious traditions. Mm. 
Because when we impose our tradition, we're saying that the Bible itself is not sufficient. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that I find shocking, and I had a conversation on Twitter about it, is how many of apostolics, re- uh, how many of apostolics reject the, the doctrine of sola scriptura, which is the Latin phrase scripture alone. I and, wonder, uh, honestly, <laughs> if they would answer that honestly as well. Because you said you wonder how many. Oh, no, I know. <laughs> I, know. I had a conversation on Twitter where uh, a, a prominent a prominent apostolic writer uh, does not at all like the idea of sola scriptura. Mm. And, and, of course, a key component of sola scriptura is the idea of the sufficiency of Scripture. The reason we believe Scripture mm-hmm. alone is because we believe that Scripture is sufficient. And most apostolics and preachers, more than anybody else, do not believe in and trust the sufficiency of Scripture, which is why we have to add to Scripture right. all of our traditions and, and, and things that we add to add to the Word of God. Okay, I'll play the devil's advocate like Tony did earlier. Um, that There is no Bible verse that says exactly which Bible books should make up the Bible. Um, don't we gather all of like the writings in the New Testament as we understand them today based on tradition? The, uh, the issue of, of canon is like, uh, is a very, very big, very big issue. Um, the, uh, the canon of the New Testament as well as the Old Testament was settled well before there were any church councils. Mm-hmm. So the mistaken idea is that church councils determined count uh, the canon of scripture. They didn't. Yeah, I see. Church a lot councils on... recognized the canon, but they did not set or determine the canon. Yeah. the the ta- The canon of scripture was already accepted by believers for um, some cases centuries before the uh, the councils uh, confirmed what what the canon was. Yeah, I've seen a lot of Trinitarians online, especially uh, Catholics. Yeah, yeah, uh, they'll talk about um, like we'll, we'll say, well, what's the historical case for like the Trinity, and then they'll say, oh, well, you don't trust the the Church councils to establish the doctrine of the Trinity, but yet you've trusted them to establish the New Testament books. Yeah, but they didn't establish the New Testament well before there was a canon. There was a there was a recognized or well before there was a council, there was a recognized canon that the church accepted. Mm-hmm. Well before any council ever said, "Hey, this is this is what the New Testament or the Old Testament." So well before look the like. tradition, there all was. Yes, absolutely. So I'm <clears throat> And a great book to read on that is James White's book Scripture Alone. He deals mm-hmm. with that aspect. Um um very well. He deals with the aspect of how the canon was. Yeah, two more. Yeah, two things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, James White's really good on some areas. Isn't he, he is. Yeah. He doesn't like one that's Pentecostal yeah, that the, much. But there are some areas that he can he have a little work on. But there, I, I really like it, and I really enjoy listening. His to His book Scripture Alone. I just finished it, and now I'm reading. I'm reading a book. It's either Michael or Matthew Barrett called uh, called Sola Scriptura, mm-hmm. and it's both of them are fantastic reads. Like I'm. That's my that's my reading phase that I'm in right now is the whole concept of sola scriptura. My, my I've got two questions. Um, Tony and I we've talked about before with some guests kind of hit on it. What is and given in the light of the conversation we've just had, what should be the true test of apostolic fellowship? Because we there's a lot of people out there that if they if people have televisions in their homes they don't fellowship. <laughs> If if they um, go sporting events, sporting event, uh, and and you and you can take it, they're all down the line of how how d- mm-hmm. deep into you movie go. theaters. What is the Christmas? Tr- mm-hmm. Yeah. What is the true test of apostolic fellowship? And back to the quote we talked about before. So, what does it mean to you that you don't have to be my twin to be my brother? Well, to to it means to me that you don't have to be my twin to be my brother. Is that you don't have to be identical to me and how you see um, the practicality of, of sanctification. Mm-hmm. That we don't have to draw the same lines in the same places. We don't have to agree on everything. No, absolutely no. not. So you're my brother if you... I have, I have people who are my brothers in Christ who have television. I have brothers, people who are my brothers in Christ who do not have television. I have 
people who are my brothers in Christ who go to ball games and people who are my brothers in Christ who don't go to ball games. You've got a few with beards and a few without. Exactly. I go to baseball games. I enjoy them. I do too. I love <laughs> I love the Cubbies. So, so that's something we both have in common. That's there. it. I'm not in fellowship with them. <laughs> <laughs> You're just fellowshipping us? I'm just fellowshipping you. Uh, it, it, it's, it has over nothing, the Cubs or over ball games? It has, it has nothing. Over sports. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the sports. It's just that I don't want to get invited to go because I don't want to be pressured to go and be bored. That's, yeah. that, it's he's, purely he, selfish. He's that UFC guy. He's I got you. Now. Anything That's that has it. a ball, he's out. Yeah. I got you. Unless yeah. it's a ping pong. Yeah. yeah. You, play, you play ping pong? <laughs> I do. Oh. I'm not good at it, but I like it. I'm not we'll good be right at back. No. <laughs> I'm not good at it either, but I like it too. <laughs> okay, I like playing theological outside. ping pong. Oh. Yeah, you've done that a few times. <laughs> All right, so answer Brian's question. What is... Um, Test of fellowship? Yeah. I think the name and the spirit. Sure. Uh, Colossians three fourteen and 15, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So if you have the family name, you're 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 part of the family. You're part of the family, yeah. And what was your second question? Oh, it was it was he already answered. All right, got gotcha. you. Uh, you don't have so there there should be that allowance to pay for people to disagree. Yeah, that, there has to be, and and God is so specific because part of part the thing one of the things that is essential to the nature of God is logos, or word. God has no problem articulating Himself. God mm-hmm. has no problem stating clearly what he wants, the details of the tabernacle, the details of the priestly garments in the Old Testament. God has absolutely no problem articulating specifically what he, um, what he uh, requires from men. And there are, <clears throat> there are certainly categories of, of things in Scripture that God places greater importance on than what he does others. And we, we have the common idea that all sins are created equal, that uh, there's no difference. You commit one sin, you may as well commit another one. Well, that's just theologically ignorant from top <laughs> to bottom. Uh, there is a, not only is there a hierarchy of sins, but there's a, there's a hierarchy of commandments, divine commandments. And so... Uh, of course, Jesus makes the statement the one we're all familiar with as as one as Pentecostals is um, that the first commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our mm-hmm. God is one Lord. Well, it's not chronologically the first commandment. The first commandment that God gave that we have recorded that God gave to creation is let there be light. The first commandment that God gave to humans was be fruitful, multiply. The, the first commandment chronologically is not Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. First commandment hierarchically is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Yeah, but not apostolically. <laughs> yeah. And so so not all commands are created equal. All, not all commands are created equally. Therefore, not all transgressions against those commands are are, are are viewed the same. Some sins are abominations, others aren't. And Jesus said to Pilate, He that delivered hath delivered me unto you hath committed the greater sin. Yes. And I could go on and on and on and on and on with this mm-hmm. with this concept. But there there's a hierarchy of both commandments and punishments for violating those those commandments or transgressions. And um and so you have places in the Bible where the Bible says, If you do this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Bible doesn't say that about everything we say that about. Mm. If you are an adulterer, fornicator, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But when you study the, the list of statements where he says, if you do this, you will not inherit the kingdom of God, that list is not nearly as long as what our list is. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And if God wanted to say, for example, in 1 Timothy 2, 1 Peter 3, the text on jewelry that we so often misunderstand, there's nothing about those in those texts that attaches the kind of language of, except you do this, you shall die in your sins, mm-hmm. like Jesus says in John 8, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And so the, the first test of fellowship, the first test of brotherhood is, first of all, the name and the spirit. But in terms of conduct in life, whether or not someone, <clears throat> whether or not someone is saved, is going to depend on whether or not they are unrepentantly, stubbornly committing that list of sins that 
the Bible says, if you do this, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm. Pour past that, mm -hmm. there has to be some grace and flexibility that comes into sure. it's such how we view one another. It's such a beautiful thing, way, <laughs> like the Bible gives, like with, with things that we would refer to as holiness and separation, <clears throat> how it's, it's primarily it's always just principles. Yeah. That's given you as a pastor the responsibility yeah. of seeing, well, what, <clears throat> how do I apply this principle yeah. in this local congregation? And, and, and how is it that we can be, in our context in North America, faithful to what the Bible is teaching us where we're at today? Because cultures change over time, but yeah. the principles of God's Word, they always stay the same. Well, the, those things that, I, like I talked about, mentioned uh, just previously that you do these things, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, obviously, those are timeless mm -hmm. truths that do not change right. ever generationally. Um, but in terms of, I guess we could use an example of where we focus most of our attention on this topic is is outward outward adorning clothing, like how long a how long a skirt should be, or how long sleeves should be. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the Bible, the Bible does not go into specific detail about about those kinds of categories. He tells us that we are to dress modestly. Mm -hmm. He gives us a list of certain things that he considers to be nakedness. Mm -hmm. And I think that we should that we should attempt to cover the things that the Bible specifically says is naked. But nakedness. But beyond that, there ought to be a tremendous amount of flexibility in what right. in what we um, in what we do and, and how we how we see one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And in a local congregation, I think much of it depends on the conscience of that church, mm -hmm. the conscience of that church and, and where they have been. Uh, but in terms of salvifically, uh, I have this weird theology of if, if the Bible doesn't say it explicitly, then there's Christian liberty mm -hmm. in that particular area. Well, I am... Uh... You got anything else to say on this? Because there's something I'm just burning on the inside. Yeah, I mean, I can sure I could say a lot more on this. But I, mean, I, I enjoy talking about it sure. because you talk about something that's relevant to where we live now, and when when like when you look at like today's society where there's like blurring of gender. Of, of gender lines, and yet you know we have the principles in the scripture of holding to the separation and distinctions of gender and. And and so many things. So Deuteronomy twenty two five is where that stuff usually centers with the mm -hmm. woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So what what's interesting to me in that text is that the Bible does not that I'm aware of does not specifically lay out this is a woman's apparel or mm -hmm. this is a man's apparel. So it doesn't say women can't wear and gives the list of items they can't wear. It doesn't say men must and cannot wear and give the list of items. It gives the broad principle. Right. And the reason I think that is true is because obviously that was written in an Old Testament context to Middle Eastern Jews sent a millennia before us. And so the reason why God doesn't say give the dress list for what women have to wear and what men have to wear is because God never intended to Middle Easternize the entire planet for all of history. Amen. And so he, he left the principle of sexual distinction to be interpreted in every within culture. time and cultural context. Yeah, and so in, in Western culture, our separation of what is distinctly a man's dress and a woman's dress is not exactly the same. As it is go in, to Asian culture or African yeah, completely culture. completely different, 100%. And, and, the, and we are so arrogant in our Americocentricity. That yes, we are. Not only do we try to missionize the world, we try to Americanize, Americanize the world. world. And, and that's not the will of God. And you know, the beautiful and, thing— And going back to—I'm sorry, but going, yeah. going back to a theology of sexual distinction of dress within biblical culture, I do not think that the dress and clothing was as radically distinct as what— we have attempted to make it in first century culture. First of all, when you go back to the Garden of Eden, the Bible says that God put coats on them. Mm -hmm. He didn't say you put one kind of garment on Adam and another 
kind of garment on Eve. He put the same kind of garment, the same garment on both Adam and Eve. He put coats on them. And like almost every time the word skirt appears in the Bible, maybe with one or two exceptions, but almost exclusively when the term skirt is used in the Bible, it's referring to a man's garment. (laughs) The oil that ran down the beard of Aaron down into his skirts. And so... I'm glad I'm Americanizing that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) nobody wanted to treat me in a skirt. (laughs) Yeah. And so, but, but the point is, is that the 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 major and there were distinctions between male and female clothing but it isn't as radical it wasn't as radical a difference as what we're trying to make it in 21st century american culture the primary way in which you saw male and female distinction in scripture is men's ha- men have beards obviously women did, didn't i believe women in the bible had long hair mm-hmm. uh uh under normal circum- circumstances men did not and so God gave an external sexual distinction Amen. token to to male and female, and that is He made men wear beards and grow beards, and and women not to have them. Where, where I see the beauty of this is um, when when you go to like Revelation and it talks about how there's people there from every kindred, nation, yeah. and tongue. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not interpreting correctly, but I just assume that when John looked into heaven. That's what he saw. Yeah. was people of every kindred, nation, and tongue. Yeah, and how did he know they were that that was that way? There was it's, a cultural expression could, of clothing. He could see that they were from those cultures. They could he could tell they were from all these different places. And so this is a conversation I, I had with the man in our church that we talked about some of these distinctions and and you know and to me, like I said, that's that's where I see the beauty of of the of of having these separations and having these things to where we can apply them within our culture and maintain yeah. faithfully to what the scripture That's says exactly right. and honor God in our culture, in our society. And I think the best way to do that in American culture is that men wear pants and women wear skirts. That's the best way to apply the principle of sexual distinction yeah. within American and culture. And see, and I even asked brother Carol, when we talked about that before, I was like, well, you know, in American culture though, um, I was playing devil's advocate because I believe what he just said. But uh, but I was saying, but in American culture, there's, again, that blurring of the lines. But I think I responded that even within the LGBTQ community and the secular culture, when when uh, Bruce wants to become Caitlyn, what does he do? When Bruce Jenner wants to become Caitlyn Jenner, what does he, he do? He his hair out and he put on a dress. Put a dress, yeah. Why? Because that's, 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 that's his appearance. Yeah. Because if you want to become a woman... Even in even in a culture that tells you that there are no mm-hmm. binary uh, sexual contrasts, and in, in look culture, at the restroom signs. Exactly. Yeah, I know I that's mean, that's one of the most basic things that we've, yeah. we've said for a long time. But there's a lot of truth in that. Yeah, hundred percent. There's a lot of truth in that. And so when when Bruce wants to become Caitlyn, long hair, uh, dresses, skirts, because even even. Uh, in that particular demographic of American culture, they know inherently mm-hmm. that in our culture, if you want to be a woman, you got to have long hair, and if you want to be a woman, you. I'm just gonna say this: Bruce slash Caitlin's not the only woman I've seen with a beard, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Crucial uh, conversation. <laughs> this is a very forward talk when we're talking yeah, about very beard. Forward, hey, I, I appreciate what Brother Bernard said. Yes, against beards in the UPC on women. Oh, yeah. women. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm well. I must ask you. Uh, forget about all that. That is funny. So I, I'm. God's really been dealing with me. We talked about a little bit off the record with a prior guest today. That um, and I've talked to Brian about it. I've talked to my grandmother about it. Um, about something that you've actually went through, um, <laughs> and it's something that apostolics, Pentecostals, aren't supposed to talk about. Yeah. But we're going to talk about it. Yeah. Because it doesn't get talked about. Yeah. So, yeah, bring that second book to the top. Another shameless plug here. (laughs) So, um, let me explain myself. And you've actually Um, read that. I have read this. So, I'm going to to dig deep if that's okay with you. Sure, go ahead. Um, So, um, God has genuinely been dealing with me, specifically this year. I can't say since January, but I say for the last three or four months, about disqualifying those that God has qualified. Yeah. And 
as a organization or a religion, um, we tend to do that. Yeah. Um, and I am fourth generation apostolic Pentecostal. Yeah. Uh, my grand, uh, my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mom, and my me and my sister. And but my grandmother also has a son with two other kids, and I am one of four grandkids, and I'm the only one that hasn't been divorced. Yeah. A fourth generation apostolic Pentecostal, and it comes. We were talking today, Brian, um, with with this other guy off the record that divorce hits every household. I would say almost in the United States, it affects yeah. somebody, and yet it's so hush hush. Yeah, and it's not acceptable to talk about. Can you tell your story? How much of it? As much as you will. You said you'd stay up well, all night talking, so we're good. I'd stay up all night. And what time is the restaurant close again? About 10. 10. 10. 10. Right. Close that's, 10. So you've that's got... Lindsay R. Carroll for those who yes, don't know. Yes, that's right. That's my amazing wife. Amazing, beautiful, talented, gorgeous wife. You've got three hours. And if you want to come over and take the, the mic, story. come on. <laughs> yeah. Good. You sure you don't want to come on camera? <laughs> you look like you're dressed for it. She is. She's dressed way better than all of us. Oh, I know. Sure. I'm wearing yeah. my... my Flight casual clothes. I'm embarrassed, but right. I want you to I tell the story. Sweat, so well, I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> well, I was married for almost 20 years, and um, I was raised in a apostolic. I was raised in an apostolic church culture that um, taught heavily what I define in the book as the no cause view of divorce and remarriage. That, <clears throat> and in fact, uh, Lindsay was raised with the exact same view of divorce and remarriage that I was that are a very similar one that once you were in the church or Christian child of God if you get divorced there is no possibility of being remarried and saved no matter no matter what the reason for that divorce was and in fact um, a former pastor of a former pastor of mine not only taught that that remarriage after divorce was sin but divorce itself was a sin mm-hmm. that that it was a sin to initiate a divorce, regardless of what the cause was. Your your spouse could be committing every kind of sexual sin known to man, and you still had no right to even divorce them, much less remarry. So this includes physical abuse, physical uh, abuse, emotional sexual abuse, pedophilia, anything? you name it. There's no excuse. There's and this, no justifiable. And this is something that, that your church. The church that preached. I grew up in, yeah, preached and taught mm. that. Okay. And so probably the reason why, at least from the standpoint of going through it, that the reason why I stayed in that marriage so long is because there was, at least at the beginning part of the breakdown of the marriage, the idea in the back of my head that if if I divorce her, first of all, that that's a sin in and of itself. But then your whole but, church is going to disown you. And and if I do divorce her, then there is no way that I can ever have another companion for the rest of my life. And of course, I was I was in my I was in my early mid twenties whenever I was in my mid twenties whenever um, um, things started going badly in my in my first marriage. Can I? Ask and you? so the idea of of being twenty twenty five or whatever age I was that from that point forward being lonely being alone for the rest mm-hmm. of my life and if I remarry then my only eternal destination is hell can I ask you this real quick tying in something we asked earlier about like doubting God was was there times when you were doubting like if God was even there was it tied to what was going on at home I, I have no doubt that it was I have no doubt that it was and to 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 be honest, the the time frame that I put, the time frame that I put on going back to where yeah, four or five I, years I've ago. got a I've got a freedom from struggling with that does coincide with does mm-hmm. coincide with my divorce and divorce recovery. And so, and I think a big part of it goes to like everything's tied to the nature of God. So whenever mm-hmm. you look at 
whenever you see a topic like that and someone's telling you that if you ever divorce for any reason and marry someone else, yeah, you, will burn in, you will burn in hell forever. Well, that affects how you see God. That affects so, your view of God. I guess my biggest question is, so you're expected to it, live in hell and then die and go to hell. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. And so, so from my perspective, the only way that I could be married was to stay married to that. You know, in that situation, that's the only way I was going to ever have Mm -hmm. anybody in my life. And so from a human perspective, I see it that that's the reason why I didn't I didn't get out before I did. But from a divine providence perspective, if I would have gotten out of that marriage at at 25, 26, 27 years old, then I would have never uh, the timing would have not have been right. I would have never met this my my beautiful wife now so so you were you, the thought started coming at the age of 25 how how long have you been married at that point probably 4 years and then you got divorced so for 16 years almost yeah you got divorced at the age of what was i 39 i think wow. when i finalized wow that's a long time. And obviously, going without saying, this is something you never thought would have happened to you. Yeah, I mean, when I got the day I got married, the the, the last person in the world that was going to get divorced was was me. Right. Where you, what was your walk with God like from twenty five to what was it thirty seven? Uh, sometimes great, sometimes not so great. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's you know. What was your ministry like? Up and down. Yeah, weren't you, didn't you start a church during this time? Yeah, I did. Yeah, it was up and down. I would hit a measure of, hmm. I would I so, would hit a measure of success, and then there would be another episode, and it would set me back for months or years. Wow! And then I'd come back again and hit another level or measure of success, and then there so would be another episode. I'm just going to ask me. you something incredibly personal. Whenever you um, started the church, while you were having thoughts of divorce, were you just like struggling, a struggling marriage does that when they have a child, they're hoping this is going to help my marriage. This is going to benefit me. Do well, you think that church plan well, was kind of like that? Well, no, actually, it happened during the after I had initiated the church plan. It, gotcha. I didn't become a, you know, aware of the situations until sure. after the church plan happened. And I want so that eventually led to me resigning that that first church plan. Yeah, that had to be so difficult. Yeah, it was. And I, I want to say, as a married man with a child, um, if you are having marriage issues, um, don't bring a child into it. Don't yeah. think that a child is going to solve your... I adopted two children hoping to... So what you're saying, you're validating what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, exactly. Don't, don't bring, a, don't and, bring and, children and it's into it. And it's the same story with... It's the same story with... Um, with... Um, Lee and Rachel. Yeah. Um, same story with Lee and Rachel. She's mm-hmm. trying to have kids saying, now will my husband yeah. love me? Yeah. And he never did. Not the way he loved her sister. My favorite preacher it's, preaches it's, that the best. J.H. Osborne. J.H. Osborne. In the morning it was Leah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the point is is that if he don't love you now, you know, having his baby isn't going to make 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 him love you what what about that baby or what about those flowers or what about that card says he loves me it's a card it's flowers it's it's sex yeah it's it's not necessarily love yeah you know but go ahead i don't mean to keep interrupting no um so so yeah it was just it was repeated episodes of situations arising and and uh Eventually, I woke up one morning. It was literally like this. I woke up one morning and like something snapped, and I was I was done. I called mm-hmm. a lawyer, filed for divorce. So when all this transpired, was there spiritual mentors in your life that? fought you over it well interesting kind of interesting, interestingly my dad my dad came to push me to divorce my first wife that 
he he's like son it's time you need you need to do it but he is adamantly opposed to my remarriage so he wanted you to get divorced but was not cool with a remarriage exactly mm. so he wanted you to be alone <laughs> yeah uh, man well, is well, i'm a firm believer that. that man is not meant to be alone no he isn't it's not well it's biblical it's yeah. not good that man yeah. it's not good that man should be yeah. alone that's there's a there's a whole sermon series that I've just indulged myself in about men not needing to be alone that God created a companion for Adam yeah. and when men are alone they're alone with their toys and with their toys they'll play and yeah. uh, I heard the preacher one time said uh, a man never stops buying toys it's just how much he pays for his toys that is the only thing that changes and that's the only thing that changes and whenever a man's alone he starts playing with those expensive dangerous toys so I'm a firm believer that man is not meant to be alone yeah. Well, you referenced well, it certainly a little bit in your book when you talked about when people are forbidden to remarry. I mean, it's like a breeding ground for fornication. Yeah. I mean, people feel loneliness and this, they're going to find love physical, wherever they can find this it. physical desire well, that's I within mean, everyone. I mean, Paul says to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so, God's cure for fornication is marriage. God is incredibly pro marriage. So, let me ask you something. Um, I want to ask you a question that I would wonder if I were married and divorced. Yeah. Um, do you feel like that your first marriage was not of God? Or was it ordained for a specific reason? What, I mean, I, to, to be honest, theologically, I don't know how to answer that question. I don't, I don't buy the whole, I don't buy the whole idea that, that God before all eternity creates one one woman for only one man and those two people are the only two people that can mm-hmm. that can ever be married. I don't yeah. I don't think that way at all. I don't think that's sounds a, like Calvinism. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's like it's Calvinism applied to marriage. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, because I can agree with that. I'm sorry, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna no, you can continue because I was just gonna get back on um I was gonna ask about so what are the, the different views of marriage, but the know, the first view is the no cause view. I'm good right. with you asking that because all I was gonna say is the one man for one woman, there's sometimes I, I know my wife is for me, but I just wanna you know, just sometimes. <laughs> what does that mean? I, but, watch the video, you'll see my hands. <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> well Edit there, that out. there is uh, there are no two people that I thought she just texted me. <laughs> Oh, there are no two people too. that that can live together without conflict. No, it's impossible. There's no two people that no. can live together without conflict. Not at all. And so marriage takes a lot of hard work to, to make happen under the best of circumstances. And it's the will of God for that, that struggle and that tension to happen. Because yeah. as much as I hate to admit it, especially with my wife sitting here, there's things about me that God needs to fix. And that God needs to work. Is on. there is there stuff is that true? needs to? <laughs> <laughs> and so, marriage is the context for for God to work those those sanctify those things in our yeah. life that need sanctified. That you know, that I no other person, no other person in your life is going to is going to help God work on those particular sure. aspects of 100%. your life, but a spouse. So, so I the, tell my the friends. The reason why God is so pro marriage from Genesis to Revelation is that is that it is in the context of marriage where God does uh, the bulk of his work of sanctification in a mm. believer's life. So I mm. I'm from Illinois, that's, that's obviously, and when I moved to Arkansas when I was getting married, um, all my friends was asking me, you know, I there was a group of five of us guys. We were always together, man. Yeah. I mean, it was almost sad how often we were together, but we were always together. And um, whenever I left Illinois and come down here, everybody was asking me, you know, there's girls around here. Why, why can't, why can't you just find somebody up here or whatever? And for the first time in my life, I actually found somebody in my in my now wife um, that made me a better person. Yeah that encouraged me to be a better person that um 
I'm going to use the word almost forced me to be a better person because yeah. I saw the way that she lived and I, I, I watched how she encounter her. She had encounters with the Holy Ghost on a one on one situation. I was like, that's the kind of wife I want. That's yeah. the kind of relationship I want. And I thank God every day for a spouse like that. Amen. Yeah. 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 I have tremendous respect for Melissa. Absolutely. For living with him. No, that's that's Meredith. But I have respect oh, okay. for her for a living. There's another okay. ML. Yeah. 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 Oh, is Melissa yeah, your wife? My wife. Yeah. Meredith is yeah. by Melissa's ears. Oh, yeah, <laughs> with, look, with Melissa, like one of the things that really made me attracted to her was her her faithfulness to the house of God. Where she had moved from, her parents were from Whitehall, three hours away. She moved to for college to Jonesboro, and being at a mom and dad's house, she could have. You know, quit going to church, anything like that. But yet, she started coming. She was faithful to the praise team uh, before I ever I, was in the picture. She was there, always committed, um, has always lived what I fundamentally believe should be mm-hmm. the way that a lady should portray themselves. And um, and it just so happens, Melissa and Meredith were friends. That, and I said, <laughs> yeah. I've said it repeatedly about about Lindsay because she actually she was in she's in the church that I pastor here, and so we. We started dating as a pastor saint situation, which my dad did the exact same thing. He uh, he actually prayed my mom through, baptized her, and they started dating like three months. Is that later. called flirting to convert? <laughs> yeah, flirting to convert. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. But she was already converted. Yes, she was already converted. <laughs> but I said that I've said this repeatedly about her. I watched her as a divorced single mom, like never use any of that stuff as an opportunity to miss church. Never use her situation as an opportunity to not do the things that she was obligated to do at at the house of God. Not just show up, but added things, responsibilities at the church. She 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 never laid down on them. And the thing that probably that probably got my attention the most about how she handled divorce life was I've watched several of my cousins go through divorces and and their wives just became like social media witches i'm out like, oh, wow they were con just constantly slamming them mm, posting yeah. all kinds of drama and junk and, and it was a big following and throughout that. and throughout yeah. the entire process she never one time made one post negative about about her ex and like that got my Got my attention seriously. So, so Lindsay, what was, what yeah, was you're, I got to yeah, talk to her? So yeah, me too. Yeah. You might need to come in. The, yeah, come come over here. Share what, my mic with me. What, what was what I'm curious is, and I was putting you on the spot. You cool with her sharing yeah, my mic? Absolutely. You didn't expect to be a guest, but I'm wondering with with your background being in church, what was what was the uh, the stance of uh, divorce and remarriage that you had been taught? That you just you didn't do it. You just stayed married. It didn't matter what they did. It was basically your husband had to die. Mm-hmm. That was the only way that you were like could be free from that covenant. That covenant, yeah. Mm. So that's so, how I was raised. So it was like, no, and really, I didn't know anybody that was divorced before. I mean, like that was close enough that I was like, okay, can I get some advice or anything? So it was always just like, up until a certain point, it was like I thought the whole time, okay, I just got to stay married and never, ever. Be just stuck with it or be alone for the rest of right. my life. See, I always, um, the, the, what I've, I've never really heard it be taught one way or the other, to be honest with you, very, very much. And that's, that's an just interesting, kind of, just kind of touched on. Now, like with me personally, what I had believed was that um, there was a one cause view, which you talked about in the book. Yeah. There's the, the no cause, which there's no divorce and remarriage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the one, then there's the one cause that if you're divorced because your spouse fornicated, yeah. that is the one exception that you are free to remarry. And so I, I had a friend that was in a divorce situation. And I even told him, I was like, dude, you realize if you remarry, you can't be saved. Yeah, I mean, I'm not talking about. I heard somebody. Say, I said that to him, <laughs> and he was like, "You need to recheck what what it says in there." How old and were you? That was not very long. I mean, I was twenty something like that, and so he. he How was old are you now? At uh, twenty eight. Okay, so it's been a couple of years. So, <laughs> well, I'll be twenty eight tomorrow. I'm twenty seven right now. Oh, happy, happy birthday. birthday! I'm just thank that. you, thank <laughs> you. But He's anyway, spending it with look, me. He's spending it with me. He's spending it with <laughs> four talk. We, too. we we can't talk about that. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, so because yesterday was my anniversary, also. and he spent it with me. And, oh uh, my Jesus! Anyway, so the divorce and remarriage. Have I? <laughs> hey, bro, I got a great yeah. one for you. <laughs> I've got it. Don't worry. But anyway, so um, <laughs> I'm off track. But anyway, but he was the one who kind of showed me because um, you know he was saying well the thing about um, for the cause of fornication. Um, but even he, whenever he was defending what he was doing, was referencing the one cause. Yeah. And in which, I mean, from what I understand, from what I remember now, I don't remember if it was exactly what was going on or what was going on. But either way, he was just presenting, well, there's this one exception here. And, yeah. and what he was, this is what he was getting to, was that the person that fornicated is in sin if they remarry, is what he was trying to say, is what his studies yeah. that he had got counsel from was. The person that got divorced that was the fornicator yeah. is guilty of sin of adultery if they remarry. Now the person that's innocent can remarry freely as yeah. and so after that, that's warped my view to where I looked at people that were remarried that that my judgment Or the guilty party. Yeah, my judgment of who was the guilty party, I was like, they're in adultery. Yeah. And so like I, so I've after since in the last eight years pretty much I've been trying to reconcile in my mind, well, what happens to the person that's getting beat every night? Yeah. Uh, Tony's grandmother, whenever she was the first oneness believer in her hometown. That, and her dad church, pastors that church now. Yeah. Her husband beat her every night she went to church mm -hmm. because of her faith. Yeah. And to, to think that this unbelieving spouse that is trying to force his unbelief physically upon his, on his yeah. wife, how do I reconcile that? Because it's not fornication. And it's and and so that's one of the profound things that I found in your book was when you started going through that just it isn't just a decision between one of the two, yeah. but there is a third option. Yeah. It's not a false dichotomy of only one person can remarry. Yeah. But when the marriage contract is broken, yeah, it's broken for both. Yeah. Just like if you're in a contract for a vehicle, if you did, if the contract falls through, both are free from that contract. That's can right. You, can you elaborate? Yeah. So. So the, the premise on which we say the innocent party can remarry, what we traditionally call the innocent party can remarry, is because we say that 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 um, adultery or fornication and divorce dissolves the marriage covenant. So there's there's no covenant left between them so that that innocent party can remarry because that, that covenant, that, that marriage has been dissolved. Well, just like you said, you can't, you can't have that covenant dissolved Probably. for only one person, for only one party. So if the covenant no longer exists, not only does it not exist for the innocent party, it doesn't exist any longer for the guilty party. If it's dissolved, then it's dissolved for, for both parties. So both are free to both. scripturally remarry. Absolutely. So, Why, so, the, so even though they're the ones that cause broke the covenant that led to the dissolution of the covenant through divorce, even though they're the one that caused that, if the covenant no longer exists, the question then becomes, what covenant are they sinning against when they remarry? And the answer is there, there is, is no there. covenant that they're sinning there against when they, re when they remarry. So what was it that, that Jesus meant whenever he said, except for the cause of fornication? So obviously in the book, I make the big distinction between put away and the bill of divorce. You may need to give us a background on that real quick. Okay, so... Or do you want them to get the book? And yeah, we want them to get the book. We Where can they find that book? <laughs> they can find that book on Amazon. <laughs> it's available in Kindle and obviously in paperback. Perfect. So I think when Jesus says, uh, whosoever shall put away his wife, save for fornication commits adultery when when he marries someone else is that um is that the only exception to having to give someone a bill of divorce instead of just sending them away is that if that marriage was unlawful or not recognized or bound by God in the first place so for example when you go back to the old testament israel was forbidden from marrying certain na certain nations of people and or there was a list of 10 that you were not allowed to marry so so in the situation that someone of the old testament in some weird way married someone that was on that forbidden family list they didn't know that was their family member mm -hmm. they could they could send that person away 
without giving them a bill of divorce yeah, because, the legal because they didn't have to go through the legal process because the, the marriage was never valid to begin with because they were not permitted to marry that person in the first place. So make that practical in like the 21st century. So let's say you have two married men come to your church. Yeah. So this would be what, what would you, you, you tell me, how would you apply? So, so because what actually means? the scripture forbids homosexuality, homosexuality, homosexual marriages, that even though that that male male relationship has been recognized legalized by the state in God's eyes that has never been and will never be a marriage and so 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 the, so those two men can can, can split up and they can marry any any women that they want of course they had to be uh, divorced in the eyes of the state yeah uh, but that's a so, different so issue. that's a complete yeah that's that that's a completely different yeah mm-hmm concept than what existed in in Israel at the time and even in Orthodox Judaism right now, you can't just you can't just get a legal state government recognized divorce within Judaism and be free. You have to get you have to get a get mm-hmm. is what it's called in Judaism. You have to get a religious rabbinic uh sanctioned divorce to be free. So if a woman divorces uh, her husband legally, say in the state of Ohio, and she's Jewish, that, that means absolutely nothing in the Jewish community. She has to have a rabbinically approved bill divorce, divorce, bill of divorce. So to, to the both of you, when you've gone through and you've studied this and, and you were taught this, how much relief did you feel that you were like, oh, that, that there's still hope for me. My ministry isn't over. Or my, my, life. my soul... I mean, how life changing was that? The freedom. Yeah. So I can I'll let Lindsay answer that one first. For me, be, like before I heard any of this or re- knew any of this, um, like being taught all you know, not even taught. I wasn't even taught. It was just what my mom. You were like, told tell it. Us. Well, I was told. It was never like it was taught over. And there's a big difference between being told, told and being taught. taught. Yeah, yeah. And even so, for like even just for me with well, my first husband was divorced before that, so they were even telling me then. That as long as his wife cheated on him, you were already in then adultery. I was, uh, yeah. Then if not, so like I had it from both. Like I had them tell me, you know, I was already, you know, basically whatever. So then when before, you know, like I, we, I had the issues or whatever. Then the only time that I ever got a like a an idea that I could even think about, you know, from a pastoral thing was I had a pastor say he was talking about something in his and he said say so and so cheated on this person that I could um then I would you know it was about a wedding gift somebody was asking about giving a wedding gift and he said I would give I would go to her next wedding or whatever and I was like so what <coughs> he he as a pastor thinks that okay if this person was doing this then I would go to her wedding so I was like Okay, so I that's where I took it. Then I finally, you know, had you know, like studied out some stuff. I had asked about some things and thought, okay, that's <clears> when <throat> I finally realized, okay, there, I'm not stuck and like there is hope. There is hope, yeah. <laughs> and that's the big thing I want people to take away from this is that there is. That's hope. the whole point of our podcast. Yes, yeah. it, it is, no matter, matter what, what you've been is. through, there is hope after di- there is life after divorce. Yeah. So my book, ministry, there is ministry and after divorce because I mean, in the book you talk about like. Um, where they talk about how to be a bishop, to be you a pastor, be the husband of one you must wife. be the husband of one wife. And you said there was a, a minister somewhere that said, when you take your fist and you put up the, the one, as soon as you add another finger to that, you are no longer qualified to be a and pastor. And he meant even after, like if your first wife died, yeah, you couldn't remarry and still remain in ministry. And so he took the husband of one wife to mean so strict that if, if my first wife had died, I... He, I couldn't remain in ministry and remarry. I could be saved, but I couldn't remain in ministry. People like that, I wonder how they feel about gluttony. Because usually people, <laughs> people like that, they, they're still eating their McDonald's. Too. Yeah, exactly. But I have a question for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so what would Man. you say to the... Um, how old were you when you got divorced? And You had I kids? Was, yeah, I had three kids. And um, I was... 29. Were you 29? 28. 28. So what would you say... When I separated, it was, I was like 27. Yeah. What would you say or what would you encourage a single mom um, 
what's what's the biggest thing they ha- they have to what's the biggest thing you took away that gives them hope that yeah, gives what did them you need to encouragement know? yeah what is something you wish you knew like before all like um, my biggest thing that I took away from it is that you can do it like my my biggest fear I think from it was because I stayed home and took care of the kids and my biggest fear was doing it on my own and then not and thinking okay I'm gonna have to live like just you know, church even, just taking them all to church and doing it all on my own. I mean, I basically did it that way because he worked out of town, but you can, like, there is a, there is hope. And then that my other thing was that even I had comments made that, oh, you have baggage because you have three kids. And so, you know, like the hope that I would be able to find somebody that would take on three kids and, you know, not have to be the rest of my life stuck by myself, that there is, you know, guys out there that do not they don't just look at okay you have baggage they look at you not just you're not stuck being like what how you felt in that marriage which in my you know my case I felt like I was worthless and I felt like I was you know like nothing to somebody so there is hope that you can find somebody and that you can do it on your own till you get to that point till you find somebody Mm -hmm. and until I met her I had always I'd always said that I wanted. I did not want to marry anybody with kids. I wanted to marry somebody. Funny that didn't how have any the kids. story changes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the the reality is, is that like her kids fell in love with me like way before she did, <laughs> and so for me to for me to date her and love her was easy because her kids were not in any sense of the way baggage for me. Yeah. Like I didn't. I didn't even blink or it's bat an eye. It's not baggage, it's bonus. Exactly. Yeah. I so didn't even I, just, I did not bat an eye at the fact that she had I do want to say that we are not advocating for divorce, <laughs> but if you are no, facing so, that divorce, so here's how there's I would, still hope. I would say we're not pro divorce, we are pro marriage. And so the yeah, the way I, I framed the argument in teaching this to to our church was that this is not about promoting divorce. Yes. But what I am teaching is about promoting marriage. And there's yeah. there's there's hope in a hopeless situation. That's exactly yeah. right. So so in a fallen world, divorce is a reality, mm-hmm. and and God is so pro marriage, so pro family, that He refuses to let divorce, which is a result of a fallen world, rob His creative children of the very thing that He created them for, which is wow. which is marriage. So, so we often go to Matthew nineteen nine and say that it was not so from the beginning. Well, what does Jesus say was not so from the beginning? He doesn't say marriage or even remarriage wasn't so from the beginning. He says divorce was not so from the beginning. But if all divorce always prohibits all remarriage, then that makes divorce greater than marriage. That makes the fall triumph over creation. Mm, mm. That makes sin greater than redemption. And so the the primary theological reason why God does allow re, for remarriage after divorce is because God is always going to continually reset the creative narr- narrative that he wants he's pro marriage and he wants people to be fruitful and multiply. That's the kingdom. That's powerful. And this is personal to God because God got divorced. Yeah. He sure did. And can you give us the scripture for that? Yeah, Jeremiah 3. Mm-hmm. He talked about all of the reasons whereby God had uh, put away uh, Israel and gave, gave her a bill of divorce. So he not only put her away, he also gave her a bill of divorce. And so, yes, um, definitely God, God divorced in the Old Testament. And, you know... Even without my distinction that I make in the book between put away and, and the bill of divorce, we quoted we quoted Malachi where it says God hates divorce, and so the way we preach that is if if God hates it, then it has to be a sin. So if God hates divorce, then divorce must be a sin. Mm-hmm. Well, that interpretation is wrong on so many levels, but let's just put it in the context like this. So if in in Malachi when it says that God hates divorce, that cannot mean divorce is a sin because God himself 
got divorced in Jeremiah 3. So if that means all divorce is sin, that means God himself sinned. He's a sinner. Yeah. And it's impossible. And yeah. that is impossible. Mm -hmm. So whatever God hates divorce means in Malachi cannot mean that it's sinful. It's certainly not God's so, will. It isn't God's That's will. That's not his intention. It for, isn't God's for perfect will. Because he's pro-marriage. And so I was sitting at a table a year or so ago at a conference that I preached, and they actually isolated a room, and they took me and all the preachers in the conference and, and put us in a room, and they all brought their Bible so that they could they could, um, they could could um, uh, Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin me over the topic of divorce and remarriage. And one preacher was just like, God hates divorce. I'm like, yes, sir, so do I. I'm the only preacher sitting at this table that's been divorced, and I promise you, the hatred that every one of you have for divorce put together doesn't measure the amount of hate that I have for divorce. None of you hate divorce mm -hmm. more than I hate divorce. And so don't sit there and talk to me about how God hates divorce, because I promise you, sir, you're, you're, you've been in your marriage for however long it is. I promise you that I hate divorce way more than you hate divorce. Yeah. Um, the, uh, one bit of criticism that could be <coughs> levied against your um, your stance is that you advocate for an any cause view of divorce. No, but that is a misrepresentation. Absolutely, it, it's not saying again because it's not pro divorce; it's pro marriage. It's not saying you can just divorce your wife for any reason. And at there's all. multiple locations in the book where I specifically say. Mm -hmm. That if you divorce for, you know, if you divorce for this particular reason, that you do not have a biblical right to remarry. So, so what are uh, just out of curiosity, then what are some biblical causes that a person could justly divorce? So I would say the short answer is that any covenant, any way in which covenant is broken, becomes a valid reason for divorce and remarriage. And so, of course, obviously at the top of the list is. As if a person, um, if a person is becomes sexually involved with someone other than their spouse, they're committing adultery, having a, a sexual affair with someone other than their spouse. That's covenant breaking at the most fundamental level. And so, if they decide they have valid grounds to to dissolve the marriage, and once the marriage is dissolved for that reason, they obviously have, I believe, a valid valid reason to remarry. But beyond that is the the issue. We touched on it. I almost quoted the scripture earlier, but we touched on the concept of of an unbelieving spouse, you know, abusing his wife, beating her for going to church. Um, well, Paul makes it very clear that if the unbeliever isn't pleased to dwell with her, and he departs, then a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. And so, desertion by an unbeliever, uh, Paul says that. That brother or sister is not under bondage, if if they are deserted by an unbeliever, and then I think, I think the case in Exodus twenty one and Ezekiel sixteen bears out uh, the idea. Exodus twenty one says that if he don't provide food, clothing, and the duty of marriage, if he do not these three unto her, then she can go out free, and so. Uh, the mutual ob obligation to, to food, clothing, and the duty of marriage, which is where Paul in 1 Corinthians gets the term due benevolence. He got that from Exodus 21. Mm -hmm. He got that from Moses' use of, of, do, of uh, the duty of marriage. And so if, if the, the obligations are not being met by both spouses to food, clothing, and the duty of marriage, if covenant is broken there, then... then um, then the parties, I think, are free to remarry, which is what in Ezekiel 16, Israel was doing. They were committing adultery with idols, with, with the food, the flour, the oil, the honey, the wine that God had given to her. She was using it to, mm -hmm. she was using it to commit adultery with, with idols. And so she was uh, abusing the food that, that Yahweh had provided for her. And so um, those, I think, are the, are the justifiable causes? No, this for isn't. You get into a disagreement, and you no, can just. It isn't like she, you know, she burnt my food, and so I'm ticked, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna divorce her and, and marry a really good cook. <laughs> and you know, and like we we've talked about during this conversation, this is such a powerful message of hope to people. Yes. Mm -hmm. This and and that, 
and, and going back to your book again, when when there's the line that's in your book that talks about how um, uh, you were kind of forced into the way I took it, it was like you were forced into studying these things, and and like your church had never heard anybody ever preach about it, and you talked about how pastors that have healthy marriages don't really have the time to focus on this issue, yeah, because they're they're they are focused more on these other problems. And and it's to me that is something you could you could apply to so many different things. Uh, when we you first came when we first uh, arrived here tonight, you talked about how the town that you're in, there's there's a lot of drug ep- epidemic in this town, and and there's so many different things that that uh, where we give our focus to could could be, you know, it, it doesn't land where some of the people are, are living. Yeah, I'm sure we are touching every pastor out there touches needs is in everybody's hearts. Yeah, but but there's other topics out there that th- this is what I one of the biggest things I took out of the book is what is it in my life now and especially if God seems fit to call me into deeper levels in the future, what is there out there that there's somebody that could be in my congregation or under the sound of my voice that I'm listening to or a listener of this podcast that we've missed? Yeah. Because we've given our attention to other things, yeah, and that person out there is broken and is in need of healing, and because we are whole, yeah, we haven't seen the need that is authentically within their heart, yeah, and that's kind of what puts you in that situation is you've gotten to this place because of a need, and now you're able to provide such both of you are able to provide such hope and healing into people's lives, yeah, and you know, I, I didn't make that comment necessarily as a negative because mm. there's plenty of other issues that are relevant to somebody's life yeah, that, that I haven't devoted time and opportunity to fleshing out the way I have this topic. And and, and that is, um, I think it's by, first of all, by design and by divine calling. It's the reason why we have the fivefold ministry. It's the reason we have... Uh, a multiplicity of, of, of ministries. And it's the reason why, I think is one of the primary reasons why that a man in my position isn't disqualified for ministry because of this. Because if the only view of ministry that you ever see is this pristine kind of perfect world scenario that we want to project in ministry, then then the person that's proclaiming the gospel to us isn't broken in any visible right. level. And so... So I think the the reason why that I'm not one of the primary reasons why that I'm not disqualified from ministry because of my divorce and remarriage is first of all scripture doesn't condemn it but second of all I'm a testimony of of I'm a God testimony mercy. of the grace of yes. God I'm a testimony of yeah. of mm-hmm. redemption and restoration and she Praise is God. likewise so that when we preach the gospel together Somebody that's facing divorce, somebody that's going through divorce is going to be able to look at us and say, hey, there's, there's hope for me in, in the kingdom of God. And so we, we, as a, we as an apostolic movement, elimin, usually we eliminate and isolate some of the greatest testimonies of grace mm-hmm. that we have in our movement from, from ministry because we have this sense of this kind of standard of perfection that the people that we put up to preach the gospel we need them to be perfect Mm -hmm. in order to do it but the world needs actually the exact opposite yeah what is it you've said before tony um about um your perfection it doesn't help me oh yeah so if if i'm looking for if i'm looking for help yeah i don't need you to tell me everything's okay yeah Mm -hmm. um I don't need you to act like everything's okay. I don't need you to tell me, you know, I've never dealt with that. I'll pray for you. Yeah. I, it intimidates me. It doesn't encourage me. No. What 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 would make me want to go to you looking for help? Yeah. Whenever all you'll ever say is, I'll pray for you. Yeah. What I've learned in this culture and or with our, you know, I was raised an apostolic too. So what I learned is, is that, apostolics they don't want to we don't want to talk about our problems because we don't want to talk about like a mental health issue or a mm. divorce or anything like that because mm. that sounds worldly if we sound worldly then we don't <laughs> we're not you know we're not, we're not living up to yeah, our name i think so mm. when people outside you know they see you living up to these standards because i mean i know i have people that have been like man i can't believe you went through that and i'm like well i mean look i've never dreamed that you would you know and it's like 
okay, because I was one of them, you know, people that, you know, I don't, you know, I don't post my problems on any, you know, anywhere. I don't let everybody know my problems. But in our, in our world as apostolics, we say we don't want to show, oh, we have problems because we look like the world. Yeah. And if we look like the world, then we, you know, we're but we're really, but it, yeah. in the yeah. in the long run, what the brokenness that we have, it helps the world, yeah. which it's is what we're supposed to be doing. There's a reason that you're put through a test. Yeah. yeah. There's a reason. There's a purpose for it. Mm-hmm. And testimony. This is your, your mm-hmm. word the other night. Yep. There's there's so much um, that's gone on when you just said mental health that we had to lose. We talked about this with Fair Easter. Mm-hmm. We had to lose one of our own because we weren't able to talk about it. Yeah. We lost one of our own to suicide. Yeah. yeah. Because. We can't talk about it. There's no outlet. It's yeah. it's it's time that 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 myth gets debunked. Yeah. Well, going back to what we talked about before, with you you doubting whether or not there was even a God, and all these pastors that came up and said, "Hey, me too." That, that was the that was the, the first the me too. Our church. Yeah, that was the original <laughs> me too. The first the, <laughs> yeah. la- the minister who preached at our church on Sunday night. He said, "My dad's a pastor. I witnessed his faithfulness, but there would be times that I would go through these valleys in my life where I would say." I'm in Bible college. My dad's a pastor. Uh, I've been raised in this, but I'm in a point now. I'm just wondering if there's even a God. Yeah. Well, the the extreme. Is, we're in a, a church culture that our relationship with God is intrinsically tied to outward manifestations. Yeah. Whether, from belief in miracles to, to, the, tongues, to, to, to speaking gifts. in tongues. I mean, every. I mean, there's there's a lot of church denominations out there that it's just simply, well, I believe that there's a God, but there is no outward res- uh, representation of that God has done a work of and salvation. We're so in us. outwardly focused that yeah. that no matter what mm-hmm. life is mm-hmm. like, we have to keep up that. Yeah. We we might be full of dead men's bones, but dad gummit, we're going to be white at sepulchers. Yeah. And see, that's the thing that blows my mind is that we have. Oh these wow! Ex- Hold on. Is that the I first time anybody said that again? Is yeah. that the first time anybody's ever said "dad gummit" on crucial? Yeah, probably not. <laughs> We're from Arkansas, but yeah. I want you to say we might be dead men. Say that we might be full of dead men's bones, but dad gummit, we're going to have whited sepulchers. Yeah, we're going to make is, it look pretty. That is apostolic as a front, right there. And, and we get it. We as apostolics, we get it. We get it exactly the reverse of how Jesus taught us to do it. Jesus said, "Clean first. The inside of the cup. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That the outside may be clean also. Yeah. What we do is say clean first the outside of the cup because we want it to look right regardless of whether it is right or not. Yeah. Wow. Well, there was a, a preacher that um, that I heard preach before. One of the, the uh, brought uh, the principle of what we're talking about to the forefront. He talked about how um, take heed to yourself and to your doctrine. Yeah, and we spend <laughs> that's right. Yeah, we spend so much time making All sure our doctrine doctrine's right that we don't, but we don't make ourselves right. That's we, right. We miss the whole point of religion at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And don't, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about our specific religion. I'm talking about as a as Christianity as a whole. Yeah, we've, because we've missed because apostolics point. are not the only only legalists. I mean, Westboro is like extreme yeah yeah Yeah. and see what i was getting to baptist what i was getting to when i was saying about how we speak in tongues and because we're tongue talkers yeah how could we ever doubt that there is a god yeah well it's because we believe in tongues we just don't believe god loves us (laughs) that's true we don't true i mean if we believe god really loved us we would it would be different yeah and steve pixler steve pixler i heard him tell the story um of illustrating this point so perfectly he said he had a he had a, a, a preacher, a pastor on vacation that came to his church. Oh, I mean, I love this story. Yes. He came yes. to his church, and, and, and the one Brother Pixler just had, he didn't have him preach, but he asked him to get up and testify because the guy was had some, if I remember correct, had he was of some renown, kind of known in the conservative, non UPC kind of. So it's one of those legit where you hold the mic so yeah. you can pull it away. It, no, he, he <laughs> let him get up and testify. and. And it, he was like, I've heard of you know Brother Pixler for years, and so glad to finally get to be here in service with Pastor Pixler. He said, I can just look out across this congregation tonight and tell that this is a holiness church. And Brother Pixler said, I about fell off of my seat laughing. He said, just that week, maybe that day, he said, I dealt with a case of adultery, 
a case of pedophilia and a case of homosexuality Jeez. in my church. In the church, people in the church. Adultery, homosexuality, and pedophilia. Just that, at least that, no more than that week. And this guy gets up and looks because everybody's wearing long sleeves. Nobody has wedding rings on. Uh, They're the that, image of holy. So oh. I can tell by looking at this church that it's a holiness church. Mm, no. And, and, and Brother Pixar was like, holiness my foot. Bro, there is a um, well, church but, in the United Pentecostal yeah, right. Church that uh, he says it from the pulpit. Anthony Mangan, Brian, you can tell a story better than I, where sinners have to fight their way through the crowd because the saints the are leaving. They have to say, excuse me, I'm trying to get to heaven. <laughs> I want to get to that <laughs> altar. But the, the saints are too worried about getting to the, be the first ones at McDonald's. Yeah. yeah. Well, Brother Harkin, he he was he told me before. Uh, Shout he, out episode one. Yeah, he was our episode <laughs> one. Uh, Brother Harkin was talking to me recently about how whenever he was pastoring one of his churches that um, he had some people in his church. Man, they talked in tongues, ran aisles. They were looked the part. They looked like they stepped off the front of the Pentecostal Herald or Life, whatever the name of it is now. <laughs> they stepped off the cover of it. He said he had three of them in their office while they were the while they <laughs> while they were talking to him about the threesome they were having with each other. And at one point he said, "I don't want to hear it." You go to that prayer room, you go to that prayer room, <laughs> and you go to that prayer room. Because until God gets a hold of you, there is nothing I can do for you. Yeah. 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 That is so funny. But bless God, if if we dress it right. Raise our hands at the right time. Then it's this is a holiness church. Yeah. Mm. And, and this is not to say that we don't fo- we don't worry about the outward. Oh, no, not at all. Because, again, back to what Jesus said, he said you clean the inward and you also clean the outward. Yeah. Yeah. Is It's not a dichotomy of we only it's do either one or. or the other. There's it's no, about it's about emphasis. It's about there's primary absolutely emphasis. absolutely no mm-hmm. sense in me putting on a suit and tie no. and having a black heart. No. Having a bad... A black suit, a black well, tie, well, and a black heart. Well, yeah. well a, lot of, a lot of standards are covering up. They are. A lot of things. That's, that's and nobody deep. in our in our world thinks as people as in different levels of where they're at in their walk. Everybody thinks that okay, you now you start here, so you should be at the same level as me because we're yeah. Mm-hmm. We, we don't so what you're saying, yeah, somebody that's been in the church for 20 years when a new convert comes in, we expect them to go from new convert to looking like you've down. been looking like you've been in church for let 20 me, years. That let fast. me tell you this story real quick. I witnessed it with my own eyes. The, the church I grew up in, which is the church my dad now pastors, bro, this is going to rock your socks or your shoes. <laughs> uh, so She's rocking them shoes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we used to have these rock star revivals, man. <laughs> and um, we would pray these new converts in, and we would have just this wealth of babies in the church. And um, we'd pray them through the Holy Ghost, and there was this one lady. That the second they got the Holy Ghost, they'd be like, "What size skirt do you wear?" I'll bring, I'll bring it to you on Sunday. Really enough in church, you knew like we have people that would say, um, "She come to church twice now. We got to get her in her church clothes." And like, I'm she more can't concerned about her going to heaven yeah. Yeah. before she looks like she. We had one girl yeah. who wore a skirt, but it was just a little too tight, so we had to like get her. We had to go buy her some new hey, clothes. Hey, there's yeah. a church in <laughs> Illinois where is if it I, his dad's church? <laughs> no, it's not. How you know what town is it? I'm not saying. <laughs> Don't say it on here. <laughs> There's a church in Illinois in a nameless town, pastor by a nameless pastor. That's not my dad's. That's kind of odd. That, <laughs> it, that's kind of odd, isn't it? That is weird. And it's you, a nameless town and a nameless pastor. You're going to know <laughs> why. Anyway, it's a horse with no name. So they named the town <laughs> after the pastor, apparently. That's right. This is what it means to be a, the parson. <laughs> He's the, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Let this man tell the story. <laughs> so so if they, have, they literally have in the church a whole... Closet full of skirts and dresses. If a backslider shows up to church in a pair of pants, a lady backslider shows up to church in a pair of pants. Obviously, she knows better because she's a backslider from there. They make her go down to that closet and put her put on a dress or a skirt before the nothing Lord says to the welcome to the church more than welcome back. You can get your size out of the closet. <laughs> exactly. I'll pass. I mean, I would just be grateful I could still fit into it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's what you got to look at it the right there's way, guys. There's a positive way there's to always spin a everything. Positive, positive spin, man. I got to say, I'm spiritually full, and there's so much more that I wish we could talk about right now. But uh, I'm physically hungry. All right, <laughs> we'll go bro, by you guys something. I'll yeah. tell you what, man. The trip 
to Pittsburgh alone was worth it with this conversation with you guys. Thank you for being awesome hosts to your beautiful home. Um, Thank you. That's we, all. That is 100% that beautiful. That, right that's there. a legit Christmas tree. It is a legit Christmas <laughs> that tree. That is a beautiful Christmas tree. I wish you guys could see it. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. Before we do end, uh, I want you to plug your two books, plug your church podcast, plug Moving Forward. Forward Talk. Forward, forward talk. talk, excuse me. See, plug it to me because I apparently uh, that's don't right. know it. Have you subscribed to Forward Talk yet? I, I just did. You I, just did? Whenever I shared it, I was like, Brian, is this his show? He's like, Did yeah. you subscribe to it on YouTube? No, I subscribed to it on Facebook. How about we do it on the show right now? That way. <laughs> I'm, I don't have You don't YouTube. have your phone? Oh, don't you don't have, have the YouTube app on YouTube. your phone? I don't have a YouTube. Sub, or I'm not a sub, you don't, don't have, have an account. Profile. There you don't go. have an account. There we go. Let me see if I. I think I am. I, I think maybe it's just that I. Yeah, I'm. No, subscribe right here. All right, all right. Check this watch, out, dude. Watch, Check watch, this out. Watch right here. This is how easy this is. Oh, all you gotta do is just hit subscribe, <laughs> and then turn on the notifications. Turn on the notifications. Turn on the, all right, now let's do this. Now let, let, let's uh, follow Where's the crucial phones? conversation. Phones? Follow crucial, crucial conversation. conversation. I do already. That's awesome. awesome. That's awesome. I do already. So plug your. Go to podcast. Okay, so. So this queso, it sounds like we're fixing to go eat in a Mexican restaurant. Queso. Are we going to go eat a Mexican restaurant? No. Oh, okay. Where are we going to eat? I want to. I know you guys like have Lazari's, and I've eaten there, and it's fantastic, and it's amazing. But we're going to take you to uh, your Lazari's. Our Lazari's. Perfect. That that works. Awesome. I'm fine. That's why I like. Did. Hey, also do this. All right, tell me. Yeah, that right there. Okay, so I saw a review. Oh, yeah, I'll give you a review. <laughs> are you a Christian? Redefining Apostolic was a book that I released in 2012. And uh, it the, the 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 big point of the book is is understanding the limitation of the term apostolic and uh, returning the the term apostolic to its original meaning. And by the way, that's a gift to you guys. Oh, that's awesome. a gift to uh, Crucial Conversation. Thank you so much. You got to fight over it. And so I'm going to tell you right here. Um, I'm going to plug your church. I don't think there'd be. A more fitting name for a church. Then Point of Mercy. I know it was so perfect when I came here, the wow. name of the church. And yeah. our church is on iTunes podcast. Our church, Point of Mercy, also has a YouTube channel. After you subscribe to us, go follow them. That's exactly right. <laughs> follow them first, then us second. It doesn't matter. And then I released this. This book was actually printed on December the 24th. So I released this recently. Uh, it's called uh, Inter- Introduction to Divorce and Remarriage, A Theology of Healing After Heartbreak. And so if you have gone through a divorce, you are facing the possibility of divorce, know someone that is going through a divorce or has been divorced for a while, or someone who has even been remarried after divorce and is still struggling with whether or not their remarriage is pleasing to God, then that book is, an, I think, a tremendous message of hope and healing. You know what? You know what? How about we let Lindsay give us what God's been dealing with her about? Give us your final word. What has God presented to you for 2020? <laughs> Anything? Like, who do you like? Like, give what, us God, my... what, you're, what you, God wants to do in you, what God wants to do through you, what God oh, has for you in 2020. I do feel like um, He's going to use my testimony of my life, of what I, you know, what I dealt with and what I, how I've grown from it and how it, has how and it'll help somebody because I feel like I already just had a couple people that have already reached out just from seeing hope in my situation. So I feel like that's gonna grow and then I'm gonna be a help to him. Hopefully, <laughs> you are already awesome. <laughs> you are already. So as you guys have heard, he's got his church podcast. The sermon series for both of these books are on that. You can go through and you can download the archives and go back and listen to them. So to the people that are listening on Forward Talk, please subscribe to the Crucial Conversation. Absolutely. And to the Crucial Conversation people, please go and subscribe to Forward Talk. They have some great content that's already been on there, and we believe there's some great things that is to come. And so it it is our honor again to be with you guys both tonight in your home, uh, to be your guest and have such a crucial conversation. Well, Brian, it has been a pleasure meeting yes, you. It's been Tony, a pleasure, a pleasure to meet you. Thank, Thank you, guys, Lindsay. for coming up here. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Oh. There it is. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for tuning in to the Crucial Conversation. And to Forward Talk, God bless. <laughs>